Okay, so now we're recording. So if you don't want to be on the recording, take yourself off. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Leslie Sandrich from the Feminine, the Feminine Perception of Beauty and Nonsense. And Chris Campbell, she can wave to you, of Look at Me. And each one of these women are about, their works are about women being seen and how we're perceived in the media and life in general. So I'm not going to spend too much time here because I'm going to let them get into it. But Leslie has lectured throughout the Hudson Valley. She started a, um, a women's group that has talks and exhibitions, right? I can't read at the same time that I'm doing this, but um, and she's exhibited at Storm King, Storm, yeah, Storm Art Center. Okay. Oh, that's Chris, I think. Yeah. Okay. And Chris Campbell has exhibited throughout um, the Hudson Valley. So we are thrilled to have you guys here. I'm sorry, my audio is, um, I'm going to turn you upside down. Leslie, let me know if you can, if it's upside down or if I need to switch it. So I'm just going to do a screenshot here. Looks good, Barbara. Okay, good. So this is Leslie, the Feminine Perception. And now we're going to go into Chris Campbell's Look at Me. These are some pretty big pieces. And I just want to give you a sense of how big the exhibit is and how big these pieces are. So. And then these are the dolls. Um, so I'm going to start with Leslie. And talk about your pieces. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to actually share my screen. Yeah, so I'm going to ask everybody else to just mute yourself. So that we only hear Leslie and no background noise. So can everybody see that? Can I get a like a thumbs up from someone? Let me just see. Hold on. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Got it, Taryn. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to read a brief statement, um, and I'll scroll through some of these images. And uh, so, beauty and nonsense, appropriating advertising and fashion imagery and using fabric patterns, old books, maps, and other paper ephemera, my collages wrestle with unrealistic gender and beauty expectations and explore the desire to break free from binaries and confuse boundaries. Many titles are stereotypical embodiments of feminine and female characters that range from the oppressed, like this one, which is called the handless maiden, to a falsely constructed binary, uh, which are girly girl and tomboy. Let me just show you those ones. This is girly girl and tomboy. Uh, male gaze, this one, directly references the default point of view in too many works of fiction. And girls need role models begs for the inclusion of more femme and female characters that are as numerous, complex, and developed as male characters. The collage process of breaking down images by cutting, ripping, and tearing, and then recombining the elements into a new composition mirrors the kind of process required to also break down and rebuild boundaries and expectations around gender, identity, and sexuality. This process extends to my work in fabric and other materials and is an essential way of thinking about the future possibilities for what we may build in terms of a more inclusive and accepting society and culture. So that's my statement, but I will just um, more casually say that these pieces were um, mostly created in 2014 as well as in 2015. And I was working from a website called tvtropes.com and I was doing a lot of research about how women are 
represented in works of fiction, like movies and television and books. Um, and I was dealing with a lot of these types of negative imagery uh, or you know negative tropes, male gaze, thinking about how women are objectified um, or represented in a way that is very one dimensional. So girly girl and tomboy um, are what tends to happen to women when there's two girls on a team. So one woman is the Smurfette principal, uh, but two women get to embody only these two very, uh, these very, these very um, one dimensional sort of ways. You know, the girly girl is very feminine, the tomboy is kind of her nemesis and they get to play off each other. Um, and so when I would, when I started thinking more deeply about some of this stuff, the idea of like girls need role models is this idea that women's roles in these um, works of fiction need to be expanded to be uh, more inclusive, to be more, more, you know, more dimensional, more complex, more messy, um, and not so simple. Um, and eventually I ended up with this piece, uh, which was made in 2015. Um, it's called The Handless Maiden, and it's from a, a mythology uh, story written in a book by Clarissa uh, Pinkhold Estes, who's, who wrote um, The Women Who Run With the Wolves. Um, and this was a really inspiring story for me because it, it tells the story of a woman whose innocence is taken advantage of, and for her to heal and recover, she uh, goes away to the underground forest where she grows new hands and, um, and becomes her full self. So, yeah, that's a little bit about these works. Um, I'm interested to hear what Chris has to say, and I hope that some people have questions as well. So now, um, Chris Campbell, um, I'm gonna introduce Chris Campbell, and then afterwards, we're just gonna have a few questions, and then I'm gonna have a few questions so that they can have a conversation about this, and then you guys can ask any questions that you have. So, Chris, do you wanna? Are you on? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Because I'm my mask. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm Chris Campbell, and I'm an artist. My work is large scale, really, really big cross stitch tapestries. Um, I work in, I want to make human experience, I want to make experiences and then connect time, nature, surface, and um, the soul. So the pieces here in the show are all about um, looking and the gaze. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So <laughs> the, um, I'm here in the space and I can show you some of the pieces. This is a large piece that um here we go it's 14 feet tall and um so as you get closer i'm gonna go right up to it you can see that it's all made out of cross stitch it's always the same stitch this piece probably used about a hundred different pieces of thread colors of thread um, and this is a full body portrait we go over here and this is a piece of a woman um, that was a, a period where I was looking, using trans models to um, think about gender and soul identity and the gaze. So I, I identify as um, a woman and cisgender. But in relationship to that, I was exploring it. So this one was inspired. Let me just keep spinning around. Um, let me go here by the images of the Madonna. And she's really, really big. And she is intended to be hang in the middle of a room. And the image of her um, dissolves and gets recreated as you get close. And once again, I'm going to zoom in so you can see. Now we're gonna get a little, little close. Here we go. Here's another piece. So my work, um, 
I'm a mom and as I have developed as an artist, the, the reason I started doing cross stitch was because I was a mother and I couldn't use oil paint. I was pe painting on plexiglass and that was cancerous. So I had to stop for a while and I, uh, I, when I started coming back to doing art, I needed something that I could do. My grandmother had passed on all of her embroidery materials to me. So I started noodling around with that and very quickly had ideas that I could explore using that medium. And that has just continued. And as um, I get more space, I also take up more space. So this is one of the original pieces that I started doing in cross stitch. And it is of, um, so it's on window screen. And although it's probably not captured, you can see through it. There's a, um, an, an essence of, that it's holding in space. Um, and if we can go over here, here's another one. So it's, it's a, another girl staring directly at you and she's four foot square. So when I stand next to her, the, um, the eyes are really, really big and it's also meant to be seen through and also done. Um, this, is, this is a nod to tapestry and when you do a tapestry, you, uh, you put the colors that you used on it. So in, in that way, I'm trying to show you exactly what I've built the image out of to take the magic out of it, but at the same time still having the magic there. So, um, and this one, is uh, it, that one is inspired by the unicorn tapestries at the cloisters. And it was um, when our current president was elected, I was thinking about how it felt to be a woman. And I had never reflected on that as much as I had until that moment when I realized what was up and what, was, what we could lose. Um, so this, um, the, it's the magic of the unicorn, and in that tapestry, it's really big. It's the last one of the series, and um, I've heard some people say it's the idea of the masculine being confined by the ring. Um, I didn't respond to it that way, but I did respond to the idea of a unicorn being magic and an essence of an identity, and there's a key part where there's a string very gently stitched, here we go, going to the edge. And that was a symbol of, of, of what can restrain us as in our identity and who we are and that to um, find our freedom, to find ourselves, it's to cut the threads that bind us. And some of them can be very small. And, and in the unicorn tapestries, it's just a chain that's holding this magical unicorn. And I feel like the same thing is happening to me as a woman that it's these thoughts that need to be cut to, um, to find our magic again, to find our power. And this is the last in this show. These are paper pieces. They're, they were done, the, um, these are done on craft paper. They're done with screen print. So I have it on my shirt. They're made out of, so I flipped, oh, there we go. I flipped, um, instead of using a material to make an X, I flattened it and I just have uh, different widths of X's, but I have them on, what would go this way, on different pieces of paper. And paper is very disposable, you, you throw it out. And then to put the image of a Barbie, which is, it's still around as this idea of beautiful and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, what is women are, beauty is measured against. Um, so, and the idea that it was disposable is created out of X's, so it's still very much on the surface um, and playing with that, having some fun. Um, that is a little walkthrough of my little show. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions of Leslie and Chris and let them kind of talk back and forth. And if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or we will ask you in a couple of minutes. But Chris, before you stop, could you show the back of your piece that's hanging? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Can you show the back of your piece? So the pieces, um, as I get develop my work, 
the pieces are intended to be seen from two sides. There's the plan side, which is the intentional side. You can see here, let's see if we can get really close. Uh, but on the other side, so we'll walk around, there's a point where you lose the image and then you can come back and you can see, let's see an exciting part down here. The, all the strings, so I'm, it's left exposed. Um, kind of to show that we're made out, what we're made out of. You can go into a lot of the like meaning for me behind it, but it, I, visually it's interesting. And then the idea of like, there's a surface and what's on the other side of the surface and that other side is a lot more, more interesting than the actual surface and that play of two sides. And then as you walk around it, there's the third side, which is the absolute edge where you lose any image. Fantastic. So Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, since I know both of you have children, what effect do you hope your work will have on your kids and your, their attitude toward women and transgender? Oh, that's a big one, Barbara. I'm sorry, can I, you repeat the question? I was trying to close the door because I couldn't hear you. Oh, she wanted to know what, oh, there's a little bit of an echo. Uh, she was asking about how our work uh, affects our children or how we hope it does. Uh, I got it, that's a good one. Uh, I'll start, I, uh, so I have boys actually, and um, interesting, I was reading The Argonauts, uh, Maggie Nelson's book, who's, which is amazing. I don't know if you've read it, Chris, but you should. Um, and she talks about finding out that she's going to have a son and how that impacts her thoughts on, you know, feminism and wanting to raise possibly a feminist or a daughter. And so, um, you know, I just recently read this book, but I've been thinking a lot about how I would like to raise my sons to be feminists. And so this process for me of um, making the artwork as well as investing in myself as an artist uh, I went back to school recently when they were uh, nine and 11. And so, uh, and it required me leaving the family for a few weeks during the summer. And, you know, so I hope that they, I hope that they just observe me doing what I do, honestly. And we've had conversations about what the work means. Um, and I've asked for their input. And so I do hope that they have, uh, a different relationship to women than, you know, I think, I think what I'm trying to say is that how we raise our kids is important as, as how we raise our girls. Cause we can raise our girls to be, you know, incredibly empowered and have all of this support. And if our girls decide to be in relationships with men, those men have to understand what that means and how to support that. And um, so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be raising two boys that see this uh, happening in their own home. And I hope that, uh, you know, they have different relationships and friendships with, with, with their friends and who are girls and boys also. And yeah, Chris, what do you think? Oh, you're on mute, unmute. Chris, you have to unmute yourself. Great. So I'm, I'm blessed. I have a boy and a girl. And it's one of those things that in, you know, ideally, I was like, oh, they're going to be the same. But it's a, both, you know, my boy is very masculine and to see him learning about himself and, and all of those questions. And then the same with my daughter and her femininity and her masculinity. Um, it has allowed, because of the work and as I learn, I have conversations. I bring the conversations home and there's, I would hope, but only they can say, um, the vulnerability in those conversations that we've had about it. So I understand it's their identity and how they understand it. Um, I'm trying to like, I think I got off the question because Leslie's answer was like, I got, was really good. <laughs> 
No, but you're talking about something that's really important as well is just to have those vulnerable conversations and to be introducing ideas that, you know, our society doesn't tend to introduce until a lot later. Like, I mean, I think feminism should be taught in, you know, starting to be taught in like elementary school, some of the concepts, just in terms of, you know, uh, how every, how, how people are oppressed. I mean, they are learning this kind of stuff in social studies, but it doesn't usually get connected to some of these bigger ideas until you're in college. So, um, yeah, I mean, the conversations all start at home. And uh, I've even tried to be really intentional about like not, not assuming they're heterosexual, like the game of life, you know, you, you, you play the game of life with kids and assume that they're going to stick, you know, an opposite gender into the car with them. And, <laughs> you know, like right away from that age, you're, you're teaching those types of roles. And so it requires a lot of unlearning, I think, that I've found anyway, about how, how some of those reinforced gender roles are even in my own head, you know, and how do I undo those and then very intentionally raise that, you know, we watch movies a lot too. And um, some of the movies we watch from the 70s or the 80s are just like so cringy and the kids are starting to understand, <laughs> like, the, you know, when we watch movies, uh, how these gender roles play out. And so it's just calling attention to it and trying not to make it a heavy conversation, but sometimes it is too, right? Yeah, and um, so in my experience with mothering, I stayed home with them. So I felt my kids are now in, they're 12 and 16. So they're no longer, they're on the teenage end of things. And I definitely look back and say, my power as a mother was zero to five. So um, mm -hmm. and everything I'm doing since has been built on those ideas. And when they were two, I didn't, we, yeah, they, with, the conversations were different. Mm -hmm. But they, um, I find as a parent going forward that when they we discuss a lot of their gender and sexuality, how they self-identify, that it brings up things with me that I didn't realize I had that I have to deal with before I can come back to the table. But my job as a parent is to accept them. Like that is it. Yeah. It is to support them in life and have them do everything I can to make them flourish and be engaged human beings. So in that way, um, I just kind of work really hard at that sometimes. And just like with the game of life, we've painted those pegs because the blue and the pink didn't work in our family. But like, <laughs> I agree with you. It was like one of those little things where you're like, wow, now you have to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a moment where it's just, it's a game. But like it's teaching, those, those teach things, you know? So having awareness around those biases as things grow and change is really important, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. one to five, right? What, what do we do before they're five? <laughs> well, even looking at clothes, oh my God, I could write a whole book about this. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's interesting because you can see where kids go as they, as they progress through different stages, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give you guys some questions that are in the chat room. So Leslie, um, Ruth asked, do you have any idea for a work and then look for images and materials or do images in the news media prompt the idea for your work? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it happens both ways, probably, Ruth. Um, uh, Sometimes I find imagery that just is very strong and speaks to me and seems like it needs to go in a certain direction. And other times, um, like with the handless maiden, you know, I was very intentionally sort of illustrating a story. And so because I was illustrating a pre-existing story, I was looking for images that would support that story. Um, so those ones kind of happened with the idea in place. And then I was really working to try to uh, find the pieces that I need, but I also uh, spend a lot of time, part of my process is just, um, you know, deconstructing these images. So even when I'm not building something, I'm cutting things out and putting them aside for later. And sometimes uh, that process of breaking things down also leads to connections. So, you know, 
that woman looks like she needs a pair of wings or whatever, you know, like those <laughs> things can happen and then that can lead to something else. So I, you know, I try to stay open to the process, which is often hard. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this worked last time. Why isn't it working this time? Uh, so to try to just, you know, let it flow a little bit. And sometimes that means uh, not being so intentional and letting, letting, letting myself make a mess and then clean it up and, and somehow in that things emerge. Thank you. Chris, um, um, Ruth asked, how do you break down the color patterns for the thread? Uh, I use a program. So um, my, in my 20s, I worked for catalogs. And this is when Photoshop was really new. So I got, I, my job was to, they, those catalogs, they take a lot of times, they take a stack of white shirts. And then you get the swatch and you have to do it in the computer. But that was before we had screens that actually showed the real color. So I had to learn how to read color. And I would say that um, I, that experience of knowing how color works, how it transitions from a computer code into reality, I use that through the computer program. So I, I know how, what it's going on. I usually stitch a little bit. I definitely start with the darks. I start with the lights. And then I can see how the color is going and I can run it a little bit or change a color as I go. Um, but a lot of those, most of the decisions are made before. And then I'm, I'm tweaking as I go. So you're, tweaking, so you're tweaking on the computer, not on your canvas. Um, usually on the computer. Yeah. I'll go back. I'll check. Um, but like there's, it's minor stuff. It's usually in a transition that I have like it's here. I had to go back because I was like, it's something's funny going on, but it's really understanding how the color works and then seeing, cause this is out of DMC floss, which is what you make friendship bracelets out of. And mm -hmm. I think they have 300 color, 300 colors. So there's just so many colors to pick from. And we should say that you've got, you've got a lot of this yarn from your grandmother, right? Yes. So um, doing a craft, a traditional feminine craft, and then to know that it, the materials, um, what happened was, so my grandmother was a weaver and um, she dyed her own wool. She spun the own wool. And when she passed away, I got all of her materials. There's a side thing that happens as with all weavers, I'm guessing, there's, they get, have all this embroidery floss and they don't like embroidery floss because it was all, you could use it for little things, but it's always the same consistency. Um, it's not really exciting to work with. So when she died, I got her box of embroidery floss and, and all of her women and weaver friends floss. So I had this container of a massive amount of, from all these women, and it's one of those things I still have in my studio, is this, this box of floss from many, many women that have has been collected but unused and I, I there's something there that connects me to the whole going forward as women that maybe something small and little that was not used back then that now we can we can change it we can make it bigger we can use what we know to take up space and to be seen to be heard that it's really that we do this work because of our, our ancestors, of where I come from. So wow. that, that is important to me. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up. If anybody has a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask um, Chris or Leslie whatever you'd like to know. Anybody? Or you could type it in chat. Leslie, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you didn't mention it that I heard that if you use the, the sources for your materials. You have patterns, right? Mm -hmm. You have collage and painting. So I assume that the, it, there, that has meaning too. That the, but so the, the, where do you get your images from? Do you have as much meaning in where you get your images from as the images that you use? Well, that's a good question. And it's a hard one for me to answer only because um, I did find that 
I was that, okay, so I was using a lot of, I was appropriating a lot of images from fashion and advertising. Um, the images that I was able to find were, you know, readily available. They were high quality. They were thick paper. Um, and so in terms of like meaning, what I was trying to do a lot of times was undo the, in, the initial meaning. So because they were from fashion, because they were advertising, I was trying to sort of take them in, reconfigure them and kind of undo them and then, and then put them back out again. Um, and one of the things I found as I started grad school and, and continued to think about these in a deep way was that some of the baggage that these images were bringing with them was actually um, not insurmountable, but it was causing me problems in terms of getting to some stuff that I really needed to get to. And so honestly, what ended up happening was I set aside the collage work and I started sewing. Um, and so the one of the, like I loved what you were saying about connecting to your, uh, the legacy of women in your family. Um, so for me, when I kind of put down the glue, you know, I had a teacher who was like, I want to challenge you to not use glue for an entire semester. And I was like, but how am I going to put things together? And uh, looked at the sewing machine and thought, well, I can use that. And so for me, collage ended up becoming, you know, still a process that I was using, but in a very different way. And so then I began to use fabric and fabrics that did have more meaning to me. I was able to get at that. Um, the thing that you're doing with the back of the, the the tapestry where you can sort of like see the messy insides, you know, through textile work, I felt like the, the ideas that I was trying to get at in terms of a body, um, about our vulnerabilities and our frag fragilities, um, I was able to get there faster with the textile work that I was doing in the soft sculpture and, and all of that. And so I actually haven't entered back into the, um, the collage work with the things that I've learned um, quite yet, but it's coming, I can feel it. And so part of like, you know, I felt like there was still a lot of re restrictions that I was having within the frame, as well as with the imagery and the process. And so I'm kind of excited to get back to it, but it ends up being something like, um, like here's an example I can show you of where like, you know, she's not on a board anymore. Like she's, she's a lot more free, right? She's on a stand. And I've even thought about like animating, um, using the cut pieces in a more dynamic way. And so, um, so yeah, I, I love that question and thinking about like meaning and what these things bring to the work um, that, that add to the work in a way that's either in, intentional or not intentional. And we should tell everybody that you actually have a graphics background, right? Yeah, I worked as a graphic designer. And um, so, you know, that the knowledge that I have of composition and layout and all of that was was definitely there. And I actually had to fight against a little bit um, just in me trying to develop as an artist. So I have another question if there's no more. Okay. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> but okay, should I? Um, so in my work, I think a lot of the idea of the feminine and the masculine, and that we have both qualities inside. And your work, it seems like you un you understand much more of the feminine of what it is to be female in this culture right now. Mm -hmm. Do you have an inclination to go through the masculine lens at all with that? Well, again, like I love these questions because this is where I ended up going with the textile work and the um, the sculpture work that I'm doing now. Like there's definitely a need to um, neutralize gender a little bit and talk about uh, talk about bodies, bodies in the plural as well as in, you know, the multiple expressions that we have. And so um, after some of these works were done, I was referencing something like the, the hero's journey. Um, and then I discovered there's a book called The Heroine's Journey. Um, and so I loved, you know, that idea of like, how do we integrate both the feminine and masculine, no matter what our genders are, 
in our own identities is really important. Um, and I don't think I was doing that very well with the, with the works necessarily that were there. Um, but that's what I mean about like getting back into that process now as, you know, as I've learned all of these things. Um, I should mention too, because Julia Kwan is on the call. Hi, Julia. I know you have your camera off. I hope you don't mind. But Julia recommended this fantastic book um, called Females by Andrea Long Shu. And um, I don't know if you've read it, Chris, but you might enjoy this one also. So Andrea is transgender. And the premise of the book is everyone is female and everyone hates it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's such a brilliant book because uh, it it comes from a perspective and a writer who is able to break down those 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 gender um, restrictions and talk about it in this really open and creative way. Um, and I've actually, interestingly enough, like again with Maggie Nelson's book, The Argonauts. There's you know motherhood, my relationship to my body because of motherhood has um like there's some disassociative things that have occurred with me that i've um been interested to start reading about in terms of a trans experience which this is like a completely new thing i've been thinking about just recently um but you know going through motherhood and like being pregnant and nursing and sort of like what our bodies go through is uh kind of a trip you know like <laughs> it's pretty amazing so so i'm there's two questions, two on, questions the chat, on the chat but i want to ask you a question, question because you just mentioned the idea, the idea of, of transgender, transgender and i know that chris works with this a lot in her work so i'm going to ask you to address, to address that, that. Because of the reverb, I turned off my mic again. Should I come I to you? Can you just, can you just repeat the just question, repeat the question half. in the second half? Okay, so the question is, is Leslie was just Leslie talking was just, about the idea of transgender. And I know that your work deals with that. Deals with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you talk about that for a minute. For a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll turn mine turn off. Mine off. Um, um, my work my is work very is intuitive, and, and it, it, how I came to working with work 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 transgender work. models was, was through, through being with them and uh, being in a space where they were, they were transgender, transgender people, people were safe. So I could be in so that, that space, that place that was exhibited earlier. Um, um, it was a very safe place very safe for place transgender for people. people, so there was a relationship, a relationship I got in my in body. body. I'm trying to think. Kind of my experience. So, so if a human if being, a human being gets, to gets to experience label one gender, and then at another at point, another through point, through point process, process, identifies identifies something else, process. that process is very, very valuable. And that is a human that is a human experience, experience I, think, I think, has enlightening things for, for all, all of us, all of us from. Learn from. and I, and I, that experience of questioning touches upon, touches the, upon soul. the soul, and that is why I was using the models, because, because what I'm going what after, I'm going after is this in these human bodies. So I honor them. Hey, Chris, I'm sorry about the reverberation. Um, um, I don't know how to how to turn it off. Um, um, I just want to say, before we go on to the next question, if you haven't, haven't seen the exhibit, um, it's up through October 3rd, and it's, and you, you have to make an appointment. So, Leslie, um, Julia asked what you're currently watching and reading. You know, based on, based on, on what you see in the media, um, as well as, um, you know, what influences you. Yeah, thanks. Well, Julie, I mentioned, uh, and for everyone else, the females. Um, and then the Argonauts by Maggie Nelson, which also drill, deals with um, uh, trans issues specifically through Maggie's partner. 
Um, and so those were literally the last two books that I read. Um, highly recommend them if you're interested in those types of things. Um, I also, you know, really love Bell Hooks's Feminism is for Everybody. Um, and going back a little bit to like, how can we teach um, our boys and young children even about feminist issues. Um, this book is uh, just so good. And I just keep going back to it. I could read that over and over again and have it on my bedside table constantly. Um, what am I watching? I don't know. I'm not watching a lot right now. <laughs> I'm not a lot of news trying not to, right? What about you, Chris? Um, I'm reading uh, Unlearning Racism books. And then I'm also really into um, Murakami. I'm going, going through uh, Haruku Murakami, who is a Japanese author. And that's just fun because it's the Japanese, it's just a different way of looking at the world. So not to, as much to do with feminism, but more to different ways of looking. Yeah, he's fantastic. I read a, I've read a number of his books. Holy cow. I think Julia had another question for you, Chris, too, about the, and it was the qu same question that I had as well, the role of transparency. Yeah. Um, also is related to like the material you're using. I think I read on your website that um, it's an open weave and I know your those smaller ones were on screen, but are you still using that or is it a material you can purchase? So the screens that um, to hang the free hanging work, like what's behind me is on pet safe window screen. So that's, um, it's much more durable. It's meant so that a cat or a dog can't rip it, um, which also means it's, um, much more durable to, to hang in open spaces and to work on. Working on window screen is very, very fragile. Uh, the transparency thing, I, it is always, it is something I'm still trying to understand and uncover. But I, um, so I went to grad school and I'm, I'm from, I did SBA and I always had a problem with oil paint and how heavy it was. And what I was always looking for, I think it was craving, was that's why I was working on plexiglass, was being able to see through something. The ability of, of we're in this space, but not, but we're transient in this space, that we exist, it's like a metaphor. So we exist as the shell floating through the space, but and what is that shell? What is the container we're in? How does that, um, What does it mean to have skin and take up space? And what is it? We get labeled on that skin constantly by the outside world. What do those labels mean to the inside? What does it mean to see? So yeah, what does it mean to feel the inside of your skin, but to be judged on the outside? Yeah, I love that. I think I read that on your website too, this idea of the outward and the inward gaze. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how uh, yeah I and I think I know what you mean too about you know like there's a there's an in-betweenness to to what you're able to do that is something I've been striving for in in my work as well and it's such a difficult thing to um, represent visually because it's this it's this ephemeral thing you know it's the it's a cloud it's a it's a you know, I think, you know, what you figured out is really effective, though, I, the video on your website where it shows the piece um, in the industrial space, like in that hallway, and um, it does become like somewhat ghost-like, but, but there's still a presence to it, but the way that it shifts and changes depending on what's behind it or how you're moving around it, I think is really interesting. And like, I loved what you said about that there's one point where you're at the side and it disappears. You know, like that's really interesting and, um, and a fun thing to play with in terms of how your work is seen. Thank you. Thank you. Does, does, <clears throat> yeah, thank you everybody. Does thank anybody everybody. else have a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, again, you can schedule a visit to see this. It's totally free and it's a beautiful, 
women's exhibit. And you just have to call ROCA, uh, 845-358-0877. And it's up through October 3rd. Um, anybody else? Anything? Well, I just wanted to say I thought it was really interesting to show my work next to Leslie's work. Yeah, because um, there's it's de both dealing with the superficial of being female and and the interpretation of that experience. Um, and there is something very um, when I watch just so people who want to come and see the show to see collages and you know that they're made of images you see like it, it, you'll see the patterns but there's something um skin like about them and there, it allows you to to think about all the images like when i so when i was looking at them i was thinking about all those images we're inundated with and the patterns like the just the cuts of how we are there were it just it cut it it was worth seeing <laughs> um, well, and it's and it's also all the messages that we get that we don't even know that that people receive male and female about what what women are or how we're seen yeah and how we are expected to exist in the world yeah exactly so thank you and it's interesting because you guys are this month and then at the end of october we have two guys Two men exhibiting, so we'll see how that difference. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you both for being here because um, it's been really interesting to listen to the two of you go back and forth about your work. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing this, Barbara. Chris, I'm, I'm planning to come on Saturday with Taryn. She's in the call right now, too. Um, so I look forward to seeing your work in person, I feel like. Um, it needs to be experienced. Um, the detail is just incredible. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. And thank you, Barbara, so much for this opportunity. Oh, um, thank you. If anyone can make it to, to Roca, it's such a beautiful spot with um, lovely like sculpture garden. And there's just, it's just such a great place to, to visit if you're in Nyack. And actually there's a, an outdoor sculpture outdoor right sculpture now. Right now that's about women's all the women's political um activities over the last 30 years in in one gigantic sculpture so awesome yeah, you can yeah. See that as well. Let's go. So all right well thank you so much everybody for coming today and um thank you you can see more of my work on my website uh it's just lesliefandrick.com the collage work is on there and you can see some of my newer work, which is the textile based um, and sculpture work. You want to give them your Instagram as well? Oh, sure. It's Leslie Fandrick Studio. So it's my name with studio at the end. And Chris, and you Chris to... my website is Chris, K-R-I-S, Campbell, yeah. art, art, dot com. And my Instagram is Chris Campbell, Chris Campbell. art. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I'm going to stop the recording now. And hopefully that'll stop the reverberation. <laughs> driving me crazy. Uh, yeah, no, that's not stopping me. All right, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.